Hi, I'm Justin Moss. When Frida Kahlo died at the age of 47, her obituary in the New York Times was basically limited to reporting that Frida Kahlo, comma, the wife of Diego Rivera, comma, who was also a painter, has died at the age of 47. Interesting to note that they're saying also a painter, meaning like in addition to Diego Rivera, the famous muralist, to whom she was married, or that her number one claim to fame and identity was being the wife of Diego Rivera, and as a footnote, she was also a painter. As late as 1970, even among professional art historians, Frida Kahlo was known almost exclusively as having been Diego Rivera's wife, who also was an artist and painted. She was known to have been an eccentric and provocative and at times even difficult, radical in her politics and whatnot, but that was it. Her art was virtually unknown um, and it was not really until the mid-1970s that there began to be a discovery of this woman as an artist who the Tate Modern Museum today claims to be among the most important artists of the 20th century. That's a staggering pump for one's reputation in a relatively short period of time. And I, in my lifetime, have witnessed her going from almost total obscurity to this staggering, towering persona who now has become one of the most recognizable icons in the whole of the world. She was born in 1907 and had a family of interesting uh, and accomplished uh, parents and siblings. Her father was German. He was a photographer. Her mother was native Mexican and she was very proud of that identity which was also during her lifetime going to come into focus and then after her death continue prominently into the uh, La Raza and Chicano movements that would really define the um, stature of people from this part of the world in the United States up until the present time. She did well in school, although had some behavioral issues and whatnot, but by her late teens was an exceptional student and clearly was headed for a career uh, in medical school and then on into practicing medicine. But when she was 18 years old, she and her boyfriend, who was a member of a group of very politically active people, were going home from school on a wooden bus that collided with a streetcar. It was a terrible accident. There were a number of people who were killed, and Frida Kahlo was badly injured. Many bones were broken, both of her legs, several vertebrae in her back, and maybe most tragically, she was impaled by a handrail, a metal handrail, uh, that really pierced her body and would cause, along with her other injuries, much suffering, agony, pain, and discomfort for the balance of her life. One of her close friends, uh, who knew her for her entire life, observed once that as he knew Frida Kolo throughout her life, she literally lived dying. She was dying all of the time uh, with one tragic reoccurrence of a physical issue after another. Uh, she claimed to hold the record for operations. She'd had more than 30 during her life trying to repair this terrible, terrible damage. Uh, but during her long, long recovery, she was bedridden in an immense plaster of Paris corset, if you will, trying to stabilize her back. And her mother brought her paints. They developed an easel to hold canvases for her and a mirror in which she could see herself. And she spent months and months observing herself and painting self-portraits. She said she painted herself because that's what she knew best. And she was immensely introspective. Uh, her suffering was enormous. She knew the trajectory of her life had completely changed. A career in medicine was out of the question for her now. And she gravitated more and more closely to the art that she was making as the sole source uh, and wellspring, if you will, of inspiration that governed her very existence. After she'd made enough of a recovery to get around, 
uh, she began to get more serious about her art. She had a collection of paintings, and she had met the most famous Mexican artist of the time, Diego Rivera, the well-known muralist whose work was all over the world at this point, really. And uh, she decided very bravely, very courageously, that she would gather up her paintings and take them to Diego Rivera to have him give a look and give her his opinion as to what he thought of her artistic abilities. Uh, she approached him as he was working on a mural in Mexico City, and he looked at her paintings and thought she had tremendous potential. He was very moved by her originality, by her courage, um, by her reduction of classical uh, academic ideals into something that really reflected much of the uh, Mexicanidad, Mexicanness that was uh, so important to people, throwing off colonialism and establishing themselves uh, as a people in their own right, with their own set of values and aesthetic um, uh, platforms. And she took encouragement from his opinion and began to very seriously think of pursuing a career as an artist. She also very seriously thought of pursuing Diego Rivera, and she did. It was a mismatch. In many ways, her parents were opposed. They said it was the marriage of an elephant and a dove. Uh, Diego Rivera was 20 years older than she, um, maybe 20 times heavier, and she was very, very fragile, very small. He was a large man and pretty severely overweight for much of his life. But nonetheless, uh, Frida pursued him, and he left the second of his common-law wives and ended up marrying Frida Kahlo. Um, the terrible accident in which she was so badly wounded, she often refers to as the first of the two great tragedies of her life. The second was meeting Diego Rivera. Their relationship was extremely raucous, stormy, with a lot of conflict, much infidelity, initially just on his side. Uh, later on, she certainly contributed her share of infidelities to their relationship as well. Uh, there was a lot of rage, a lot of anger, but at the same time, she was trying to build a career. She was living in Diego Rivera's shadow, and uh, actually on one of their trips, I believe, to New York, she got a little cheeky and was greeted by the press as they were uh, getting off of their ship, and she made a statement to the effect of thinking that she herself was the better artist of the two, of Diego Rivera, and that created quite a stir and a good deal of controversy. Um, they went through all kinds of politically tinged escapades that were defining their identities in the public life uh, that they led. Both of them were members of the Communist Party, which after the revolution in Mexico had gained a toehold and had attracted many followers, uh, he was commissioned by John D. Rockefeller to paint murals in the lobby of Rockefeller Center. And this was a very important commission, and people all over the world were paying attention to exactly what this would be. And when the murals were virtually finished, it was noted that Diego Rivera had painted in a figure that looked suspiciously like Vladimir Lenin. And as the Rockefellers considered themselves capitalists and the communists to be their enemy, it didn't work for them. Uh, Diego Rivera was paid and fired, and in two days workmen showed up and destroyed the mural that he had created at Rockefeller Center. He did much work in Detroit at the Institute of Art. There, murals that are famous to this day and people make pilgrimage to, they had a couple of long stays in San Francisco, and there are a number of wonderful Diego uh, Rivera murals to be seen there in San Francisco. She had become well-known, well-connected, uh, not only because of her connection to Diego Rivera, but because of her idiosyncrasies. She would dress in the clothes and the iconic style that is so widely known and recognized around the world today, and going in one of those red and yellow long-skirted dresses into a social gathering in New York City always created quite a stir and gave her a very special and unique look. She was her own character, fought the idea of commissions, and threw off everyone's 
attempts to either dictate or guide her artistic um, sensibilities in any of the projects that she undertook. There's a famous story of a woman who was well known to Frida Kahlo and most of society in New York. Her name was Dorothy Hale. She's very well connected. Her husband was also very well known and he was tragically killed in an automobile accident leaving her a very young widow. Dorothy Hale struggled to establish herself in a new relationship, in a career with an identity. She was running out of money and becoming desperate, in fact. And Frida Kahlo and everyone who knew Dorothy Hale watched her basically unraveling as she struggled against this mighty current that was seem, seemed to be determined to simply overwhelm and drown her until finally one night she committed suicide by jumping from her apartment on a high floor of Hampshire House. One of Dorothy Hale's close friends was Claire Booth Luce. And Claire Booth Luce commissioned Frida Kahlo to paint a recuerdo, a painting in memory of Dorothy Hale that Claire Booth Luce wanted to present to Dorothy Hale's mother as a remembrance of her daughter. And she was expecting a nice likeness of Dorothy Hale painted in Frida Kahlo's own style. And what she presented to her was something entirely different. The painting was shipped to Claire Booth Luce's apartment, wrapped, and it was unwrapped, and so shocked Claire Booth Luce that she nearly passed out. Here's the painting. It's entitled The Suicide of Dorothy Hale. And it is a remarkable, remarkable departure from what Claire Booth Luce was expecting. Um, it's gruesome. We see Dorothy Hale standing in her apartment window. We see her about halfway down to the street. And then we see her piled up at the bottom in a pool of blood, wearing her favorite dress with a corsage of roses pinned to it. And uh, the inscription that Frida Kahlo wrote in blood red paint at the bottom of the painting, also painting the bottom section of the frame in a blood red color. Uh, the, the legend reads, in New York City on the 21st of October, 1938, at six o'clock in the morning, Dorothy Hale committed suicide by throwing herself from a very high window in the Hampshire house. In her memory, Claire Booth Luce has commissioned this retablo which was executed by Frida Kahlo. She thought of destroying the painting, Claire Booth Luce, and was talked out of it. Uh, the sculptor Noguchi, who was a good friend of both Frida Kahlo and Claire Booth Luce, painted out Claire Booth Luce's name from the legend. She didn't want her name associated with it at all, and it basically was hidden in the garage or some closet somewhere for many, many years. People who knew of the painting thought it had been destroyed, uh, but it surfaced after Claire Booth Luce's death and her husband, her son rather, found it and recognizing its importance in the, in the catalog of Frida Kahlo's work, donated it to a museum. But it's one of Frida Kahlo's most famous paintings. Let's look at two other images just to give uh, you people who maybe aren't terribly acquainted with her work some idea of how idiosyncratic Frida Kahlo really was. Here is a painting entitled The Broken Column, and it was painted at a time when Frida Kahlo was having terrible, terrible back problems, and she'd had one failed surgery, uh, was about to have another trying to repair this damage. She was having terrible trouble either standing or sitting for extended periods of time, and the fractured vertebrae from that terrible bus accident in which she was so badly injured did so much damage. She's painted herself with a column replacing her spine, which you can see, and it looks like it's in shambles and that it's about to collapse. I mean, this is a starkly challenging and brutal painting, uh, but typical of her self uh, scrutiny in those days and her, again, reinforcing the statement of, I paint myself because that is what I know best. Another painting of hers uh, which we can look at for just a moment is entitled Thinking of Death. It's a remarkable piece uh, in which she's painted a little skull and crossbones 
right in the center of her forehead. And again, it just is a great illustration of how frank, stark, and brutally honest she was during the whole course of her life. She went on to inspire a cult long after her death as her re reputation began to flower and really flourish and it inspired all kinds of things. Actually, the whole gamut from Barbie dolls to operas. One opera which was written at the inspiration of her life story uh, was accomplished by Robert Xavier Rodriguez, an American composer who has had really a significant career. He's one of the best and most impeccably trained composers uh, among us today. He studied in Paris with Nadia Boulanger, uh, who taught virtually every significant American composer. And I think he's written something like eight operas during the course of his long and wonderful career. Uh, the opera premiered in 1991 in Philadelphia, and John Rockwell, then the chief music critic for the New York Times, dubbed it the best opera musical theater piece of 1991. And today, it has been seen at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, American Repertory Theater, ART, in Boston, one of the most important stages in the country. Uh, Houston Grand Opera. Most recently, it was produced at Michigan Opera Theater in Detroit, where those famous Diego Rivera murals are. And now Florida Grand Opera brings it to South Florida for the first time. A truly remarkable artist by the name of Catalina Cuervo has made this role of Frida Kahlo her own in this piece. She is an astonishing, riveting performer, a wonderful singer, and it's hard to imagine anyone producing Rodriguez's opera, Frida, with any other artist except in the event that Catalina Cuervo were not available, uh, was working somewhere else. She's the artist of choice for this piece and a magnificent performer indeed. Uh, I've come to know her. She's been here with us a couple of times in South Florida and she is a true star. She takes the stage and before she says a word, everyone in the audience understands exactly who and what she is and it is formidable indeed. The opera is based on an important biography, the first comprehensive biography of Frida Kahlo that was published uh, and it basically takes us through in an exemplary fashion with episodes that are the central anchors in the life and development of Frida Kahlo. She separates from the boyfriend who was with her on the bus when she was so badly injured. She meets Diego Rivera. She is shattered by his infidelities. They're ongoing and serial though. And the final blow, I think, comes when Frida Kahlo discovers that Rivera is conducting an affair with her younger sister. I think that really pulled the plug in many ways. She moved out of the house they shared together in Mexico City, took an apartment uh, downtown, and then after a while proceeded with making a divorce. And she and Diego se separated and divorced, but curiously enough, remained very close and in constant contact with one another during that period of separation. They continued to conduct extramarital affairs. Uh, they had a lot of troubles in their life. They knew and hosted the Trotskys, Leon Trotsky and his wife stayed with them for about a year. Frida began to conduct an affair with Leon Trotsky, which made Diego Rivera quite jealous and concerned because of Trotsky's position within the Communist Party. Trotsky at this point, of course, had been exiled from Russia and had come to land in Mexico City after wondering about in Europe quite a bit. Stalin, though, was poisoned with rage and anger at Trotsky for having, he felt, betrayed the Communist Party and betrayed Stalin personally. And an agent of Stalin was sent to Mexico to assassinate Trotsky. His girlfriend was someone who had studied and worked with Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo came to know her boyfriend, who was the assassin and after Trotsky was killed, 
and assassinated in Mexico City, Frida Kahlo and her younger sister were arrested and held for a couple of days for questioning uh, and considered to be possibly implicated in that terrible crime. She wasn't and was finally released, but as you can imagine, this created just a lot of turmoil in their lives. Diego fled the country at Trotsky's death for some period of time and uh, came back later, at which time they were reconciled. And actually, they, they decided that they would marry again and did so. And it's kind of remarkable to see them having come through full circle with all the struggles, all the desperation. Um, Frida Kahlo very much, I think, identifying with that woman from the 1930s who she knew so well, who jumped to her death from Hampshire House. The struggle, especially for a female trying to survive, trying to make a name for herself, trying to establish herself out from under the umbrage of somebody else and whatnot. Uh, I think that's what moved her so desperately to, to say, I cannot just paint a likeness of this woman. I must say, make a statement and say who she was and what her struggle was and what her end was, because that in many ways defines much of Dorothy Hale's life. Um, Frida Kahlo grows increasingly fragile in terms of her health and uh, finally starts a series of amputations. Toes are amputated, and then later her leg is amputated below the knee, and this sends her into a great depression. Uh, this is all, of course, accompanied by drug and alcohol abuse, which you would almost be shocked not to find uh, in somebody's repertoire as they're going through that kind of torment and aggravation and uh, desperation, really. She finally has begun selling paintings, though. She has a show uh, that she sells about half of the paintings. She has an opportunity to uh, sell a couple of paintings to some Hollywood stars, Edward G. Robinson being one of them. And then she finally is so sick that she realizes the end is absolutely near. Um, there was a show in Mexico City being given. Her doctors had ordered her uh, to, to not to attend, that she had to adhere to total bed rest and not try to attain a standing position. Uh, she famously had her bed delivered to the gallery and herself transported on a stretcher in an ambulance for the opening. They put her on her bed in the gallery and she stayed for the whole duration of the party. Uh, she died soon afterwards, though. And this opera of Robert Rodriguez's is a magnificent reflection of everything that made her who she was. Her desperation, her betrayal, her sense of, of uh, aesthetics, of making her own thing, uh, the Mexicanidad, everything must reflect the authenticity of who we are as Mexicans. Um, there's a lot of music that sounds deeply influenced by Maharashi sounds, uh, Maharashi um, dancing, there are those dances of the wonderful skeletal uh, death images that are so common in Mexico, and it also is a deeply melodic score, almost a lush romanticism to him. Uh, but as I've been exposed to the music and come to know it, I've grown more deeply uh, committed to to believing in it and that Rodriguez has really done something both unique and special with this piece. And I think that's one of the reasons that Rodriguez's Frida has been unlike so many operas which are new and have a big splash of publicity with their premiere and then disappear, sometimes forever, sometimes for decades before they're rediscovered. And Rodriguez's Frida has really taken on a life of its own. And it's, as they say in the business, got legs. It's been all over. It's played in Europe in a number of cities uh, in the United States increasingly. And the interest in the piece continues to grow. And I think not only driven by the great iconographic 
stature that Frida Kahlo has attained in our culture, but by the real honesty and goodness of the music and the piece. People who've seen this production and performance of Frida and of Catalina Cuervo performing it say it's one of the most remarkable operatic experiences that they've had and that it's been a thrilling, thrilling evening. I hope you won't miss this opportunity to catch one of the performances Florida Grand Opera will be presenting here in South Florida. I'd like to end with us taking just a moment to look at some footage of a press conference in Detroit that occurred before the opening uh, of their production. This is Catalina Cuervo singing The Frida You See Before You. The Frida You See Before 